Hello, I'm Robert Rickover, an Alexander Technique teacher in Omaha, Nebraska, and my guest is Imogen Ragone, an Alexander teacher in Wilmington, Delaware. This is part two of a podcast uh, series. It might be there might be more uh, on the topic of um, Alexander's term psychophysical, usually with a hyphen, psycho dash physical what it means, what are the implications of it are, which we talked about at length in part one. <clears throat> I'll be putting a link to that podcast in the description of this one, and probably it would make sense uh, to read that, listen to that first before what we're talking about now, although maybe not, maybe it doesn't matter. Anyway, so we talked about the fact that Alexander was was struggling with language. He, he didn't have the right. He his arsenal of words was not adequate to describe what he wanted to talk about, which was this idea of psychophysical being uh, the body and mind are really just the term bot terms body and mind are really just descriptions of the same thing from different points of view, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk quite a bit about that. And the fact that if you're going to have, if there is this uh, psychophysical unity that most Alexander teachers would buy into, there's also going to be a physical psycho unity, or if you want to use the term mind-body, body-mind would also be accurate. And what you know, and we we talked about the implications of that and a lot of stuff around that, but we largely stayed away from specific examples of uh, the the body mind direction, as it were. Does that be accurate? Do you think <laughs> accurate description? Well, we 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 touched on it, but we touched uh, on it. Yeah. yeah. So. You know, Alexander Technique is, I say, to a large extent about how you how you think affects how you are, right? So it's you think something, you, you can learn how to um, think in ways that are going to be really helpful to your physical functioning. Um, and but there are, there is within the Alexander world, uh, there are within the Alexander world, various um, little subcategories of things that are really more physical from the physical to the physical mental. psycho, yes, physical <laughs> psycho, or at, which, as we pointed out, was yes, not the name, but, but, but from body but, to body mind. Body if you think mind. of it as a direction, which is, in a way is is separating in an artificial way, but that's the way our language works, right. and so in a way it's the way things happen because that's how we perceive it right and alexander goes through great detail about why he has to use these words physical and mental because he doesn't have a better word for them better words for them mm -hmm. but in in alexander teaching pedagogy i guess you could say uh there are some things that are very i say can be not necessarily always are, but could be more physical to mental. And one of them would be constructive rest. That I think it's the most obvious example that you, uh, someone uh, is asked to lie down in a way that's a little bit different than they might normally. They're, they're having their knees elevated relative to their hips, and then there's some support under their head. And this is a configuration that um, takes takes as much pressure off your spine as you can do in a normal gravitational field. So it's 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 a physical way in to helping you. It's uh, parts of it are are known outside the Alexander world quite a bit. People with low back pain, for example, are told 
it'd be a good idea to put some pillows under your knees when you lie down. It's going to take pressure off your low back. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there, and generally the Alexander approach to it is you should just put yourself in that position and be there for a little while, maybe depending on the teacher, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, something like that. And that's an example of you're changing the physical you in order to change your entire body mind. Yes. And um, I typically, how I teach it, I do say if, if, if you literally just lie down in this way and you can somehow just relax into it and be there a while, it's going to be helpful. Yeah. But this is also a really good time to be using your practicing your thinking and awareness that we so so right. you might say in that case the physical is the main thing but you can bring in the the psycho the mental the yes. mind yes absolutely to to support and um even improve uh, your experience um, right. of absolutely but mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. someone who knows nothing of the alexander yeah and if there's no teacher around and you want to get a little idea of what it can do for you just put yourself in that position for a, a little while and then see what happens when you stand up you mm -hmm. might be kind of shocked um so it it you're right it it's a great platform for exploring mental directions for sure mm -hmm. but it on its own it can be pretty yeah. powerful so yeah. that's the most obvious one another one that's pretty obvious is and i gotta i gotta be careful of my words now because i, I gotta be politically correct but something that's yeah, called better. mechanical <laughs> advantage, yeah. which is basically you're bending your knees uh, and you're bending usually a bit forward around your hip joint. It's basically, I'd say your hip, knees and ankle joints are They're all bending. In, in, involved, yes. Involved. Um, and they can be to a greater or lesser Exactly. And it's a way of lowering your height uh, in a like which you would have to do for many things, like sitting in a chair, picking something off the floor, getting into a car. It's doing that in a way that um, is advantageous mechanically. <laughs> in the term. Yeah, no, it's keeping, I think it's keeping the spine lengthened and your back strong and right. your right. arms free um, and that you kind of have a buoyancy in it. It's it's basically, we're talking about squatting, but it could be the, the most minimal, almost standing it's upright very, very squat tight. to actually, yeah. literally, but you you know, it's not the the back that's, the, the waist that's, that's, that's bending. It's actually a are using those joints of the hips, knees, and ankles. Yeah, you could almost say it's a, a extension of constructive rest. Constructive rest is you're lying on a surface, not doing anything. Here, you're standing and lowering your height in a very specific way uh, that uh, uh, encourages release in your body. Mar Marjorie um, Barlow has a very nice take on it that it's a it's a conscious retreat from our ability to stand up to our full height as well you know being able to stand mm -hmm. on two feet that's kind of a human thing right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it took a long time to happen i'm guessing uh, but she says well but it might be useful to deliberately go back a little bit mm -hmm away from the full height because then you can play with it and start to experiment with it and maybe get some benefits from a deliberate going from full upright standing to a more um, 
ape-like or monkey-like thing. I got to be careful here because monkey is a charged word now, but it's putting yourself, it's deliberately going back a little bit in uh, our our uh, abilities or our, our evolutionary, our evolutionary. Is that kind of what you're talking about? It's, uh, it's consciously saying, hey, I'm just going back a little bit in order to do some experimenting. And um, I can maybe get some benefits from that. I've never thought of it or heard that. <laughs> no, I've seen your book uh, <laughs> that way. Interesting. Whenever it's, I can't think of the title right now. An Examined Life, Marjorie Barton. Yeah, I have the book. <laughs> if I read that, it totally. <laughs> oh, it's in there. I mean, she, yeah. she would just, for people who are not aware, she was Alexander. F.M. Alexander's niece and um, a very important teacher in her own right. So there's another example of where you're doing something physical in order to help improve your functioning overall. Mm -hmm. Another one, which you mentioned in our previous podcast, which I had not thought about, is the, the DART procedures. Yes. Yeah, so there's the DART procedures and there's also the them, kind of... They came about. Do you want to say a word or two about that? Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know too much about it, but um, Raymond Dart, Raymond Dart was um, a scientist anthropologist, uh, I think, um, in South Africa who had a few Alexander lessons and then was left on his own to... to and I think he maybe had a son that had developmental difficulties oh, that they were trying... Anyway... Mm -hmm. um he, he he they created this sequence of uh i i would guess kind of developmental movements but they can also be looked at as a kind of evolutionary point of development point of view as well um from lying down face on the floor to kind of crawling to oh, coming yeah. upright mm -hmm. and that yeah. m position of mechanical advantages within this sequence right. um um so he and of course we it's, it's done something. in a he was doing a physical thing you could say yeah primarily. um yeah and some alexander teachers have really um um incorporated the dark procedures and what's called kind of dark work there's a way of working with people in a hands-on way or just in a mm -hmm. guided way in a chair and it kind of takes you through primary curves and secondary curves and it's going through this physical if we're separating um sequence of movements that you know brings you to a different place but of course that will change how you're thinking aware emotions your mental state um right yeah. So those are three examples of things that are body-mind, you might say, in the Alexander world. Um, but I've come across a couple of others, uh, one you're very familiar with, power poses. Uh, Amy Cuddy. Amy, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where you're, very, well, you may, why don't you say a word or two about what they are and, and why okay. they're here. So Amy Cuddy, I first came across her because she did a, a, a TED talk about this, um, um, uh, developed these, these poses um, that might include standing with your he feet a little further apart, hands on your hips, kind of called the Wonder Woman or Superman pose. There's a one where your arms are up high, kind of V for victory pose and um there are a couple of other ones on top of head yeah i don't think that's one or oh, there might be one like i well, I, she, I, I, I think I, that's what men do at meetings sometimes uh, yeah possibly uh, and a lot of the there's a lot of gender stuff of that gender you could stuff. see in different but there's um some evidence that um putting yourself in these more expansive poses or postures even for just a couple of minutes, can help you feel more confident, for instance. I do want to say that the some parts of her work were not able to be replicated and have 
kind of come under some right I'm not sure um because she was they were showing kind of changes in hormone levels of your testosterone and cortisol right. no one else has been able to replicate that piece and but there are plenty of studies that show a relationship between posture and mood um so yeah, yeah. absolutely mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. they, they <clears throat> just as uh, sort of a technical detail all of those power poses involve raising your internal center of gravity mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. a really good thing to do so there's something from outside the alexander world that's kind of getting at some of the stuff that alexander people are after but from a quite a very different, different yeah angle. and another one that i've come across uh just in the last half year or so um Having moved to Omaha fairly recently, uh, uh, for a while, my wife and I were not really doing many things in public venues. But by the end of this past summer, uh, she went out and, and discovered the outdoor pool and, uh, and more specifically, uh, the uh, w water walking um, pathway i don't know whether you're familiar yeah. with water walking i never heard of it before well water walking uh, well yeah. as its name described yeah. this, the, the suggests you're walking in a, a little a, uh, an area that maybe is big enough for two people to walk next to each other mm -hmm. sometimes there may even be the current is pushed against you so you're having to overcome that but even mm -hmm. if it's not you're just in water up to your hips roughly so you've got obviously more resistance than just walking in the air <laughs> you as you more resistance um, is that the wrong word but it's and important. that's it's a popular thing here mm -hmm. um and there's even in there's an indoor one too which which she uses sometimes uh and i, I did, i've done it a few times i was more interested in the swimming side of things but one of the things that I kept hearing from people who were doing it was people were saying, this is the only only exercise I can do that doesn't hurt my back. Or, you know, people with, with some injuries or a lot of surgeries or whatever, and, or people say, I just feel so much better after doing it. And <clears throat> I was, I've been th was thinking about that and I, I came to realize, and it took me a while, and I had to talk to uh, the resident physicist in the Alexander. I, I did major in physics, but I do not consider myself a, a physicist. But um, what's his name? The guy in Amsterdam. Uh, you know who I'm talking about, right? No. Uh, geez. Anyway, he's a, he I is, might if you tell me his name, but I don't know. Stuff, Alexander science things um can't think of his name offhand anyway but he's an actual physicist he's a, he is a physicist and an alexander teacher and the question i had it seemed to me that one of the things about water walking is it caused your center of gravity to, to rise internally now Why is that well because there's this water pushing against the bottom part of your body which is effectively pushing it up even more than if you were just standing outside uh, you know just standing on the street now i gotta say uh phys physicists generally do not think about human bodies when they're thinking about their theories and he um he had he took he had it took a long time to answer it and he had to think about it a lot. But he says, I'm pretty sure that your center of gravity is higher when you're walking in water. Hmm. And I, I, that's I, a physical way of getting expansion in your body. Interesting. Um, I'm I'm wondering, and it might actually amount to the same thing. But when you're in water, you might, although you said the back, their back isn't in water. It's kind of up to their, it's the legs that are in water. You're standing in water that's up to your hips, a little higher than your hips, typically. 
Yeah. Maybe something yeah, feels yeah. more oh, secure it that you slows you down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you could even you could even um it's not doesn't slow you down like walking in water up to your neck kind of thing, but it does slow you down and it's a different quality of movement. Hmm. And um yeah, interesting. Um, but I'm kind of thinking of any any exercise um, or sport that people do. Obviously, they you may not be doing them in a way that would seem, uh, from an Alexander point of view, efficient and well coordinated and easeful. But people get a lot of, um, I was going to say, physical benefit from exercising doing something physical and that is not that's a mental benefit right people feel better after exerting themselves often um yeah. uh, you know so but, you could say that yeah, well, going... but i think um say with water walking if 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 that causes you to your internal center of gravity to be a little higher than it was without the water that that is the same thing pretty much as saying there's a general expansion in your upper body. Mm. I mean, that's just the physics of it. And um, in terms of sports and activities, well, here's the thing. There's almost nothing you can do with, with your body that will lower your center of gravity other than going into a slump or an overarching right mm. and it, both of those would not that they don't happen when people are physically exercising but they definitely would hinder your ability to be doing them whatever it is optimally there's not usually, usually not a stimulus that would cause you to do extra slumping even if you're by nature a bit of a slumper. Yes. So <laughs> most likely, even if you have that pattern, it's actually less so when you're doing the exercise, maybe. I don't know. But anything you do with your arms and legs is going to raise your center of gravity. Bending yeah. and walking. I, I, I'm thinking how people feel often after a, a good yoga class, mm -hmm. um, which they would you know they would definitely say that's a body mind or mind body thing but i think most people the 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 poses and things are the main thing and they bring it you know they bring in a bit of of, of mindful awareness in whatever way um um I guess but there's a lot of raising your arms up or or being on the floor or um, uh, um you know and obviously it's you know, might end with a relaxation, <laughs> but it's, it's, um, I think most yeah. yoga poses are going to involve Raise. raising of your center of gravity. Yeah. So that's yeah. another thing I hadn't, I had not, yeah. well, and I bet there are a lot of others as well, but, um, the thing that we, we talked about a bit in the previous podcast is that going going in the direction of body to mind, and again, those words are not really totally mm -hmm. accurate, but um, it's a different system that's involved in going from thinking to ac action because the second one is the nervous system, the nerves which transfer information very quickly through your body, not instantaneously, but pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Whereas the changing your physical configuration and its effect on you is a little is slower mm -hmm. it takes longer for it to really kick in which again is why you know the, like you're doing a whole yoga class you did versus a whole yoga class just doing that just for a second doing a part of a pose a bunch of <laughs> yeah over a period of time that could have quite a profound effect on your overall mm -hmm. use pattern in a, um, but of course, as you pointed out in our previous conversation, the the, the quickness of the mind body thing comes with a, a a cost, you might say, in that it's transitory. 
mm-hmm. you 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 will need to repeat it quite likely uh, quite a bit maybe you know mm-hmm. over the course of your, your day but it um the point here is that you can get to the kind of changes that we alexander teachers are after both ways but in the alexander world i don't think most people think about that second way as being on a par with the first way in other words mm-hmm. it's the mind body direction that's kind of key and the other mm. stuff is seen as slightly it's i don't know it's seen as like oh, interesting but not the key thing it certainly doesn't seem to be the key thing that alexander himself was about getting our thing right. to a higher plane using our thinking instead of our feelings to guide us all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. i think he was more a mind body guy by nature mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um he doesn't as far as we know he wasn't a very athletic guy he didn't he didn't do a lot of sports and stuff like that yeah he, i don't know you have a picture of him in a bathing suit uh, so he, <laughs> maybe he swam i don't know i but, just suspect lifestyle was just generally more yeah. active yeah um, yeah. So I think, um, and and I think I think as we said before, having both these happening e- e- either at the same time or near each other is pretty useful because if you just do thinking, if you're just doing thinking and you're not moving, uh, it, it, it's, it limits the effect of that thinking. But if you can combine thinking with movement, and especially if it's movement that's encouraging a lengthening in itself, like moving into constructive rest or going water walking or yoga poses, whatever, um, that's going to be a pretty useful way to speed up your... Uh, it seems to me it's... Uh... It, it could be a virtuous circle and it doesn't, yes. you know, my, you know, so mind influencing body, influencing mind, influencing body, influencing mind. Blah, blah, blah. Right. But I think, <laughs> I think it sometimes gets short circuited. I remember when I, when I first came out to Lincoln to study with Marge and she was having people move all the time. She wouldn't mm-hmm. really. And then I got back to training course and people were spending it seemed like hours just sitting in a chair with someone working. It wasn't hours, but it could be 10 or 15, 20 minutes. And it seemed awfully slow to me after having had this experience with Marge. I'm really thinking, wow, this has taken forever. Uh, not that I didn't think it was good, but I don't think it was as good as it could have been. I think if, mm-hmm. if there had been at least some movement, if it's chair work, getting the person to bend for you know rotate forward around their sits bones and back that kind of thing and that that actually reminds me that the little aspect of the another aspect of the alexander technique that fits into the body mind direction is um body mapping Mm, yeah yeah on a very basic level showing getting people to learn where their sits bones are getting them to learn where the top of their spine is and what's going on up there and C1 and C2 and the implications of all of that. So it's interesting. Is that mind or body first? I'm not sure because it's definitely coming from a cognitive place that you're learning about it, but you're experiencing it in yourself anyway um, but it can be done without any reference to things like alexander technique directions for example mm, mm, mm. you can teach body mapping and not mention anything about that and people will benefit from it yeah i'm still skeptical whether i would say that's coming from the body because it's it's a, a mental learning about it's you know. bringing your so if i think sit bones is that coming from my thinking or is it <laughs> it's my thinking yeah i think well barbara <laughs> Campbell, who's the, the 
she and her husband were the ones who really developed um, mm -hmm. Bill Conable, her husband, mm -hmm. developed body mapping. Um, I think she's the one who 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 said that the coined the phrase, the sort of basic law of human movement that. If your percept, if your conception of what's going on in your body is out of line with the reality, then you're not going to move as efficiently as if it were in line. So, for example, with conception, conception from the, is a thinking thing, yeah. yeah, yeah, but mainly could be mainly unconscious. Right? Oh yeah. So yeah. you ask people like, well, where's your head moving relative to your your torso or your neck. I mean, most people have never been asked this question before and never thought about it. And when they do think about it, well, where is it happening? They'll often point on their head itself. Yeah, yeah, neck, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is pretty far from where it's actually happening. So their I, conception that's way out of line with the reality of their structure. So I think the fact that we're having this this little discussion about this shows how difficult this idea of mind body or body mind is what is what what is coming first it doesn't really matter actually <laughs> which comes you know it's a murky murky complex mm -hmm. field and and i think we're just scratching the surface and i did leave out part of when i read that quote from alexander in the first our first podcast I left out some stuff that kind of is muddy. I won't say muddies it, but ma makes it even more complex. So, is that for the next I, maybe installment or, at some point? We'll get into the depths of the the murk, but or I, maybe not. <laughs> but I do. What I do hope uh, from both these two podcasts. This this is a, being the second is people coming up with some ideas of, for example, other things you can do from a body point of view, you could say, that are, that are going to help the way you use yourself. I mean, that's mm. what we're talking about. And um, yeah, that's really all I've got to say. Do you, have any, you want to say some more about any of this? No, except to be curious if other people can think of other examples yes. of where, um, especially from the Alexander Technique itself, where um, the body might be the prime thing, which I, I do think in a, in a hands-on lesson, even if there's a lot of thinking going on, I think that it's the body first. Yes. That's a controversial and statement, maybe. Come teacher, back. <laughs> depending on, on the, the way the teacher's using wh what they're saying or not saying while they're... I mean, if it's it, if basically the lesson involves hands-on throughout, you know, rather than a lesson in which there might be a little bit of hands-on just to show a few things. Um there are two examples that's, that spring to mind when you say that. My first teacher did no explaining of anything, and there certainly were no directions or anything like that. He was just basically using his hands, which were quite good, to move you up and down out of a chair or table work. And huge, I had huge changes happen from that very quickly. So your use improved Dramatic, without things happen incredibly dramatic but i didn't actually feel anything during the lessons but outside of lessons it was amazing so that was kind of, he was kind of manipulating my body with uh with some ideas of primary control i'm sure in the back of his mind but he didn't mention any of that to me so you I, weren't getting any of the cognitive the psycho zero. stuff nope. <laughs> the psycho <laughs> yeah no zero um, and yet you were changing dramatically, which would have been changing how you were thinking and perceiving yeah. the world. Yeah. yeah anyway. <laughs> and the other example comes from Walter Carrington, who mm -hmm. um, I had a number of quite a few lessons with over the years I was in England. And, uh, you know, Walter was the, the master storyteller during a lesson. You'd go in there 
and he'd start talking and he would tell sort of a little story or stories that would end pretty much exactly 30 minutes later. <laughs> and and um, somehow that was relative, that was helpful. But one of the things he said was when he has an, had a new student, for the first 10 lessons at least, he would do anything in his power to keep keep anyone from talking about the Alexander technique. So he was definitely going for the physical experience first. The and physical his clientele of uh, private students, I think, mm -hmm. was mostly older people. That's my mm -hmm. sense. And he, I think he worked out that, well, that was the best way for him to help them, to just zap them uh, for a bunch of lessons and then start saying, well, you know, you could think about this. You could use mm -hmm. it your way. But not, now that's the opposite of how I work, but mm -hmm. I can see it. Oh, as and for different people, and the different people, direction will be better you know, so hold off on directions, just get them to improve their use by just doing something yeah. by getting into constructive, a constructive yeah. Rest yeah. position. Yeah. yeah. When I said direction, then I meant working with just the, the, the body side of things. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than the mind side yeah. of things. Yeah. That was definitely his approach. Yeah. And yet he was very sophisticated in his understanding of directions and how, how, people mess them up you know he mm -hmm. had very clear about that he had very clear thinking about self-directing mm -hmm. um, but he, i think for new he felt for new students he was better off not going that route until they'd had some direct physical experience mm -hmm. so he was kind of body mind and then maybe later mind body of w working with someone so mm -hmm. All right. Anything else you want to say? Um, I don't think so for now, but just we'd be, be, be uh, interested to hear from you. Definitely want to hear from anyone who has thoughts on this and ideas for subsequent, because I think there might be a series of, of these on this topic. Okay. So my guest, and thank you, Imogen, is uh, Imogen Ragone, an Alexander Technique teacher in Wilmington, Delaware. I'll be posting a link to the previous podcast and a uh, link to Imogen's website and a website where you can learn more about the Alexander Technique in general. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>